Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Liz Picarazzi tells Jay Goltz that she's pursuing multiple sales opportunities and ponders what would happen if those opportunities actually came to fruition. Would her company, Citibin, be able to handle the additional volume? In my fantasy world, where I am a lot, Liz says, I look at where this could go, and just like you, Jay, I go to, how in the world would I produce all of these? Liz and Jay also talk about the pros and cons of pricing transparency. Do you volunteer your premium price up front, on your website even? Or do you wait until you've made your sales pitch and gotten your customer excited? Plus, we indulge a little further discussion on the merits of the 21 Hats brand. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, the 21 Hats Morning Report, which highlights the most important news of the day for business owners and which you can subscribe to at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining me this week on the podcast are regulars Jay Goltz, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home, and Liz Picarazzi, who is CEO of CityBin, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, and makes trash enclosures and package bins. The episode is titled, What If I Get the Contract? Welcome, Jay and Liz. Thanks for joining me today. There's a lot I want to talk to you guys about. Let, let's start. What, what's going on with you, Liz? So I've got a couple of really exciting things going on. Um, I'll just mention two. So the first one is that New York City Department of Sanitation has an initiative to keep trash off of the sidewalk. And um, it has City Bin's name all over it. So the RFP, we got it. We replied um, or submitted a proposal. Uh, to the RFP, and um, we should be finding out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so it's really exciting. We've been actually watching this program for a couple of years. It was kind of temporarily shut down during the pandemic, and now it's being resuscitated. What are they looking for somebody to do? What, what are they asking for? So they're looking to containerize trash. That's it. Nice. It was Times Square. The Business Improvement District in Times Square is going to be using city bin trash enclosures to keep trash off of the sidewalk. Wow. Well, isn't that, I'm a little confused. It's not really keeping it off the sidewalk. Isn't it just putting your bins there and then the trash is inside your bin? So it, there's still something on the sidewalk, it seems, right? There will be um, a very good looking outdoor container. As opposed to a plastic bag with trash in it, right? Well, except my argument to that is, and sometimes the plastic bag's just not there. And I don't know how often it is there, but can, I've certainly been in New York a lot. I'm always taken aback as to the bags of garbage on the street. But so now the question is, how often are the bags sitting on the street? Are they there every single day or are they just there for a day or two? And now you're going to have a bin there for seven days a week. Well, trash is on the sidewalk all the time in New York, everywhere, whether it's commercial trash or residential or business improvement district. Um, there's a lot of different types of trash, but it's just, you know, it's pervasive. Even if you walk by a school, I was always amazed when I picked my daughter up from school, how many hundreds of bags after one day they put out there for Department of Sanitation to haul away. I mean, for a Chicago one, you're re we're taken aback because the Chicago has alleys because of the fire of 1871. They rebuilt the city with alleys and nowhere in the city of in the Chicago do you ever go where you see bags of trash on the sidewalk. Well, the other exciting thing is that trash has been in the news a lot um, because the new mayor has been criticized for not taking action on a lot of the sanitation initiatives. Um, and just yesterday, there was a big expose on New York trash that I have to say, I'm glad to see <laughs> because it points to the need for the product that I sell and I care so much about. I mean, I live in the city as well, so I can't stand seeing the trash everywhere. So that sort of pressure on the mayor can only help my business. Which begs the question, New York's so big. I haven't even done the math. I, I assume you've done. Isn't this hundreds of millions of dollars worth of trash containers? Yeah, I haven't done the math, but I know that it is. So how would you even begin? To, it's not like your General Motors. How would you begin to address that if they flick the switch and go, okay, everybody's got to have bins out front? It's a pilot. It's for one year. 
And so learning from that pilot, you know, and this is, I didn't get the contract. I've just applied for it. But like in my fantasy world where I am a lot, I look at where this could go. And just like you, Jay, I go to how in the world would I produce all of these? Um, but I have at least a year to figure out. And that's if I get the contract. So do you have any clue how many people put in for that contract? I don't, but I have an idea that it was not a lot. Meaning less than 10? Yes, far less than 10. Wow. Which also gives me, makes me, it's very encouraging. Well, when you say pilot, does that mean it's in a restricted, they've taken eight blocks or 10 blocks or whatever? Or it is. is. It's oh, actually okay. just one block. Okay. All right. Well, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So that's easy. You can certainly handle one block or 10 blocks. Okay. But you could still get to that point. Uh, that Jay was describing where suddenly. Except there's people looking at these contracts and they're going to know, they're going to ask her, what is your sales volume? And they're going to, they're not going to go give a contract for $50 million to a, a tiny company. So, and I, the question is, are any, do you know if you're against some big players out there that are putting in for this contract? I don't. This is my time, my first time yeah. ever going in on a contract. So I'm really feeling in the dark. And um, that's also part of the reason I wanted to bring it up on the show, because, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, sometimes when you're going through something you've never done before, you just want to talk to a couple of people that can say, this is what you can expect here. These are the questions you want to ask or, you know, make sure that the city pays you within X days. Like, I'm going to learn it if I get the contract and I move forward, but I definitely feel, (laughs) I guess I could say a little bit vulnerable right now that I don't know how it's going to go. I can just be hopeful that I get it. And I'm going to stay in that place for now. No, for sure. And being in the dark is where most of us are all the time. So I can relate to that. But yeah, that's interesting. Liz, you said you had two pieces of uh, news, I think. Yes. So the second is a little bit of intrigue, or at least I'm feeling it that it's a little bit of intrigue. So I've had a competitor call me twice in the last year. It's an online retailer of trash cans and trash enclosures. So it's exactly what I do. And he called me and said that he wants to start selling my trash enclosures in his store. His online store. It's an online store and it's very specialized. Um, And again, I've never done this before, so I'm feeling a little bit not at ease. But there's a few things I really like about the way it would work. And there's a few things... that I don't seem to like about how it would work. Um, So the first thing is, I mean, if he's got search traffic coming in for bear proof enclosures, and I don't yet because I haven't even launched that product yet, that means everyone's going to go to him. So to place my product there would be actually a very good thing. The other thing I like is that they do sell trash enclosures like for a living. So they have a whole customer service team that can talk about shipping and installation. Some of the things that I really dislike, but we do. And, you know, those were a couple of things I liked. They're definitely in some channels in government and higher ed that I have my on and have for a couple of years. So I guess I'm viewing them in a in much more favorable light. When he first called me a year ago, I just was not at all interested because I just viewed him as a competitor, not as a collaborator. And now that's how I'm starting to look at him. Now, the cons, this is the big one. And it's that he would be rebranding my product as his. So instead of the city bin brand plate being on the side and on the box and on everything, it would have his brand name. And he says that he does that with all of his manufacturers so everything can be uniformly branded. I guess I, I, don't, I don't like the idea of that. I'll just be honest. I mean, it's my brand. It's my product. I have trademarks and patents on it. Um, so I don't like that. But I look on the other side at what I could achieve by selling through a retailer that is already so established in the space that I want to get further into. Does this uh, competitor manufacture any product or is it all selling other people's products? So that's not clear to me. And honestly, I asked that question and he wouldn't answer, which is another thing that kind of gives me pause. Wow. I get the sense that he's probably at least 75% reseller, um, but I didn't understand why he wouldn't answer that question. There's only one explanation I can come up with. He doesn't want to admit he doesn't make anything. Because he thinks it makes him look better if he pretends like he makes the stuff and he's putting his own brand on everything. He doesn't want to give you competitive advantage of being able to tell people, oh, we make our own products. You know, you're cutting out the middleman. 
he is the proverbial middleman, it sounds like. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but he's, he just doesn't want to necessarily, you know, broadcast that to everybody. The question is, you left out the biggest piece, I think. What's the markup? So it would be 25%. Margin, meaning off Margin. the top, which is yeah. different than markup. Okay. So his markup, I think that he actually would be marking it up. So his price would be more than mine by a certain amount. So he can feel like he's recovering a bit. But we are moving ahead with um, a pilot. You are moving ahead with a pilot with this re- online retailer. I am. Yes, yeah, so I guess I'm bearing the lead line, but <laughs> um, I am. We're going to take two products. We're going to run them on his site. I'm working with his team. I figure I haven't signed anything, nothing's agreed, but we can see how it works. You know, how is the relationship? How do I feel about working with him? Um, How is their marketing? There's a lot of things that could come up that I could see I wouldn't like, but I've decided just for now to get over the branding thing. Well, is this, are you giving him a product that you already use yourself and of your own name? So you're giving him the identical product you're already marketing under your name? Yes, totally identical. Do you have any patents on anything? I do. Yeah, I have design patent. I have my trademark. Have you talked to your lawyer? It seems to me you just violated your own patent. I mean, you just might have made your own patent worthless. Maybe. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just, I would think you need to talk to your patent attorney to see if you give someone else your exact same product, they put their name on it. It seems to me you just violated your own patent. That's the way I feel about it as well. That's where I'm really taking pause and trying to look at the pros that I really like around selling, servicing, shipping. Those are big, valuable things in my mind. Is that valuable valuable enough to give up my brand plate? Well, those are two completely separate. I just want to clarify. Those are two completely separate things. That's certainly something you need to think about. But I'm talking about just on a legal thing of protecting your patent. Are you destroying your own patent or violating or whatever the word is? By giving it to him, so now all of a sudden, for whatever reason you had the patent, you no longer can enforce your patent because you just gave the design to somebody else to put his own name on it. But like, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Maybe there's a way to do that. I think there probably is a way to do it if the product is different in some way. And that might be what I need to do is create a separate, almost like a private label with the, let's say the siding color is different. There's some sort of difference in it. So that's the legal question. The practical question also is, do you just lose your entire thing of, look, we make our own stuff, it's all patented, and now they find, oh, they can get the exact same thing in a different color from this guy. Yeah, I think it would be confusing to the consumer also. How big an operation is this? Are are, are you tempted to do this because you think you're going to sell a whole lot of enclosures through it? Yeah, I think that there's potential really high volume, and I do need to kind of find out from him maybe not his level of sales, but at least traffic to his site. But the other thing that's really attractive to me is that they have a lot of government contracts. So like GSA, where they're specified within like the government purchasing portal. And um, I'm not in those channels yet. And I've really wanted to get in those channels. Same thing with higher ed. So if it could give me access to that, that also would be quite valuable. Have have you looked into GSA? Because I happen to have some experience with that because we're doing it. There's companies you hire and they get you in, they get you into the GSA contract. It's not, it's not that hard. Yeah. I I had a company actually that I worked with for three months that was not, uh, it was not worth it at all. What do you mean it wasn't worth it? They charged too much for what they delivered. I had certain search terms such as trash enclosure, which is the most obvious one for what I produce. And we were not getting returns on actual government contracts that were procuring those. But you did, in fact, get into their system. Did you get authorized, whatever it's called, to get? So you did, in fact, get into the GSA contract world, but then it just didn't drive you any business. I would say I just didn't actively pursue it because I had a lot of other local government things come up that I knew I would be better at tackling. I kind of dipped my toe in, but I also am one I don't like. I don't like bureaucracy. Are you sure this is the path to those contracts? Because GSA or or whatever government entity you're talking about is going to be dealing with your competitor and not directly with you. Yeah, I have thought about that, Lauren. That's another reason. So if they say to me, oh, we have access to all these customers that you want, and those are customers that I've never tried to get, why wouldn't I go try to get them before I go through them? 
The other thing that occurs to me is you've talked a lot about, you know, with with all the supply chain chaos, having enough supply of your product. Do you need this outlet when you're, I assume, already still fighting to have enough product available in your existing channels? Lauren, you know where to poke those holes. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's a really good thought because at this point when things are really tight, it's almost like there's a bit of rationing that needs to happen. Not so overt, but if one customer can get it, that means another customer can't. And would I rather sell to the federal government or the city of New York? I would actually rather sell to the city of New York if I had to choose. I assume you'd be relying on the service provided by this company. Do you know that they do as good a job of dealing with customers and setting up the product and making sure that everything works the way it's supposed to? So they do have a very helpful website with a lot of FAQs, a lot of videos and assembly manuals. I should probably test drive. I guess when I was American Express, we used to call that mystery shopping, where you would shop at a competitor and take note of every little thing that happened. I should probably mystery shop them or have someone else do it to see how that process goes. Well, I assume there's some online ratings for them like there is for everything to just see what google says or they're really highly rated they have very high ratings oh all right so that's a that's probably accurate i would think do they sell everywhere they do i'm sure that's attractive yeah well it's also attractive because this recent trek out to aspen as fun as it was and how interesting it was it was really a schlep And, you know, everything dealing with installation that's not in New York City, we can do, but it is a lot of effort. Um, So if this company is able to walk people more through the assembly, especially as we expand nationwide, anytime there's a sale outside of the tri-state area, there's an extra level of support that we need to provide to make sure that the assembly goes well on the other side. Do you have any idea how big this company is? I don't. But I'm a little bit concerned, Jay, that because he wouldn't answer my question about how much he manufactures, that he might not also want to provide his revenue. Well, he might not want to. I agree. But um, I'd be interested if he wouldn't. And and one way around that is simply say, oh, how many employees do you have? Because I found that people will give that up pretty easily. You could guess fairly close. I just think that would be kind of interesting to know what his resources are. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I've got a lot of research to do. You're right there in New York. That's your main geographic uh, target market. Have you ever thought about opening a pop-up store where people could just walk in and see your product and touch it? I know, I know people can walk around the city and they see them, but having a place where someone could ask questions and, um, and find out what, what's involved with setup and all that, is, is that something that you would try? We haven't. Some of that stuff is really expensive. One idea that I've explored but we haven't done is to actually do kind of like info sessions on the day of installation with a client, provided they actually agreed to it, where they could invite their neighbors over to see like the end of the trash enclosure installation. And then actually on the spot, especially if they're a neighbor, get an instant estimate visit at their house to see what sort of model would work best for them. That's just a little fantasy I have hasn't happened yet. But I think that could be a good idea to get the word out with the public because you've got the trust of your neighbor or your, let's say your block association, some sort of an event where someone on the block invites everybody to swing by. Sort of like a Tupperware party, (laughs) a city bin party. It's a garbage, bring your garbage by and we'll (laughs) see how it fits. So, you know, the rent thing, first of all, I did have a pop-up in uh, New York, and thank God I only did it for nine months because I was paying a a ton of money in rent, but I needed to try it out because my Jason home, we sell nationally, and we have a lot of customers in New York. And it was, you know, I learned a lot of things from it. Um, In this particular case, I don't even know if you need a pop-up as much as find a landlord that's willing to do a month-to-month rent, which I got to think there's plenty of empty space in New York at the moment, and see whether the expense of the rent is efficient. It might be a cheap form of advertising, though you do have to put a human being in there to stand there, which is where it gets more expensive. I would certainly leave that as a potential, though. I would definitely keep it as a potential. My office is actually within a kind of a design district where they have, you know, ABC Carpet and Home 
There's a design within reach, like on the campus where I am. Jay, did you really learn uh, interesting stuff having the pop up for nine months to change how you do anything? Um, I learned that I really don't want to pop up anywhere. <laughs> you learned you don't want one. No, okay. <laughs> and I learned that um, this is part of my hypo- hypomania. That, yeah, I did that, got it out of my system. And I really don't need to be sending people in trucks around the country and working that hard. I just don't. So um, the sales were not, they, they were okay. I mean, we did okay there. I just, it was, this is how I've always had to learn by, you know, I only learned by putting my hand on the hot stove. I needed to find out that, yeah, I really don't need stores around the country. So that's what I learned. Was it worth the significant amount of money I lost? Uh, maybe. Because I, I always say, and this is, I'm not going to be that guy on his deathbed going, I wish I could have, should have. I, I tried everything. I've tried it. And I, I learned my thing from it and I moved on. So, um, yeah, I would have always maybe wondered, oh, I wonder if we had, what, what would happen if we opened a store in New York? And now I know. It would be a lot cheaper today, I think. Well, and I wasn't stupid enough. I, I'm, I've got my hypomania under control. I didn't sign a lease for 10 years. I did a, I think it was, it was six or nine months. I you know, I did it for long enough to get a feel for things. So it was, contr- I, you know, I don't bet the ranch. That's kind of the point. And there, and there are people to do. And I, I've gotten smarter than that or more controlled or less delusional or whatever you want to call it. All right. I want to talk about pricing, uh, specifically how quick you are to reveal your prices to your customers. But let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. I'm here with Rob Levin, co-founder of Work Better Now, which provides businesses with highly talented virtual assistants. Rob, I've noticed that owners tend to have certain questions about virtual assistants. For example, what exactly can they do? Yeah, Lauren, we get this question all the time uh, because people really know deep down that they need an assistant, but they're not exactly sure how it works and what they can do for them. I would say that our clients use our assistants in one of two ways. They will either use them much like I've been using my assistant for the past eight years as an executive assistant handling my calendar, which takes up so much time, email management, database, file management, personal tasks, creating documents for me. And then a lot of our clients basically operationalize our assistants. So we have assistants with titles like project manager, marketing associate, operations manager, and customer service representative. I think some owners worry they'll spend more time managing their assistant than it would have taken them just to do the tasks themselves. How do you respond to that? Right, right, right. This is a deadly trap, not only with assistants, but really with any employees, which is, oh, I can do it faster myself. And the reality is you might be able to do it faster yourself. Of course, it's impossible to grow your business if you're doing everything yourself. I was very much uh, of a similar mindset. And what I did with my assistant is I basically told him what needs to be done and had them document it. I hate documenting tasks, but I know the processes are so important. Now we have a manual full of my uh, tasks. I only had to tell him once that he can follow time and time again. And if he's out, somebody else can follow. And also think about it this way. If you're a business owner making something like, let's say $200,000 a year, which is about $100 an hour, you're basically paying somebody to do administrative work at $100 an hour if you're doing these tasks yourself. That makes a lot of sense. What does it cost? The cost is $1,900 a month. And as you know, Lauren, we are offering 21 Hats readers and listeners $150 off per month for three months just by mentioning the word Lauren. There are no contracts. That's also very important for people to know. Can you promise a return on that investment? If you're not getting a return, something's not going right. All of our clients are not only getting a return with the first assistant they've hired, but many of our clients are now on their second, third, and fourth assistant. Where can we learn more? WorkBetterNow.com. And again, when you sign up for a 15 minute consult, just mention the word Lauren and we'll make sure to give that $150 off for each of the first three months. Thanks, Rob. And we're back. So uh, I recently had a webinar where I invited uh, Marcus Sheridan, a, uh, a marketing guru who I first heard about because. Uh, I attended a conference where he spoke, where he talked about how he saved his pool business by answering questions that his customers always ask, but that he had kind of been taught not to answer. And he claims to have saved his pool business by blogging constantly, just answering the questions that he always got from his customers. He started by talking about the price, even though 
uh, the, the sales theory often is you, you put off that discussion as long as possible, so hoping that they'll go for as many bills and whistles as possible. But he started telling people what it would actually cost to get a pool. You guys were both kind enough to show up at the webinar. I'm curious, did that have an impact on you? Any thoughts? Yes. Um, and it actually reminded me that I have his book and I've picked it up a couple times. I had an employee read it. Um, I think that his advice is really worthwhile on several fronts. Um, with regard to pricing, I don't have it like flash, right? Like I say on the homepage of my website or on the front of my brochure, but I do make it easy to find. Um, and I make sure that like on my website, on my selling pages, that it's very clear where you can see the differentiation between my product and let's say a Rubbermaid shed. So the distinction of premium, which then drives premium price, is visually shown. And then if you put that next to a Rubbermaid trash shed, people instantly understand why there's a big difference. But you're showing on your website that there is a competing product that costs less. I am. Yes. Interesting. It's not direct. It's kind of indirect. So we have this PDF that's called what can go wrong with a trash enclosure. And we have a picture of a really gross trash enclosure. And then we have arrows pointing to everything that's wrong with it. So rusty screws, broken hydraulic arms, poor craftsmanship, you know, poor materials. Presumably not a city bin trash enclosure, I'm guessing. No, it's it's a it's like a competitor, but that's attempting to right. do ours. It's actually a copycat. And we don't get into the this person tried to knock us off. But what we say is in the execution of a trash enclosure, there are so many things that could go wrong. We've done all of those over the years. And that's why we've perfected this one. And that's why it costs more. So I don't have any problem talking about my premium value, which is tied to price. I think it would be harder to do if I was less differentiated. Like if, let's say, I just had kind of a mid-priced product to compare it with a Rubbermaid, that might be a lot more difficult. How about you, Jay? You, you've talked from time to time on the, this podcast about getting pushback on the price of picture framing. How quick are you to volunteer what it costs? As far as complete pricing transparency, you know, in Jason Home, we, the prices are right there. So there's really nothing to, you know, prices are there. It is what it is. In custom picture framing, you know, we talk about price, but I can't really get into specifics because literally, if somebody brought a 24 by 36 inch picture in and they wanted it framed, that could cost anywhere from, I don't know, $140 to three thousand dollars if they ordered a gold leaf finished corner frame with museum matting linen i mean there's just there's a gigantic range there so i just don't know what i could do to go ahead and give people more idea of and then on top of which it's a computer screen it's it's really to go show someone a magnificent gold leaf frame on the screen looks just like some piece of garbage you can't tell the difference looking at the computer screen what the difference is so I, I don't know that it would be serving my customers any better or myself to go ahead and show two pictures of here's here's a three thousand dollar version and here's the hundred and fifty dollar version. Yeah, they'll look different, but you certainly couldn't appreciate the difference between it looking on a computer screen where the image is broken down to now the frame is about what an eighth of an inch wide or something. So the part that I found most compelling or interesting about his thing was that he actually went on there and talked about five other competitors that do a good job. And I just find that just remarkable. He wrote a blog post in which he said, here are the other pool builders in my area uh, that you should consider. And he listed the other builders that he most frequently loses deals to. And he said nothing but positive things about them. But he posted it on his website, knowing that anybody who read that blog post would be on his website. And he hoped that that would lead them to check him out as well. That resonated with you, Jay? Would you consider doing that? Not in a million years. <laughs> <laughs> then, then why did you bring it no, up? No, I brought it up because I'm trying to tell people that didn't listen to his... By the way, I am going to publish that podcast. No, it's all right. I just, I'm just trying to tell people what his story is and what he's saying. And, and I'm not arguing with it. It clearly worked for him. I'm just saying... You know, what is the average pool cost? Uh, you tell $40,000, I would think. It's not five, right? 
Well, you know, he would say th- that your objection to giving out the prices uh, is something that he hears all the time and that he doesn't buy, that the same is true of, uh, of pools, that there is a very broad range. But in his case, he said it was enough to give a range. No, I fully accept that. I just don't know that selling $40,000 pools is whatever lessons were learned there. I don't know that I can take that exact exp- uh, experience of him selling a $40,000 pool and go, oh, it's the same as selling a picture frame. I don't know that those two things are even close to the same. I think there's another thing at play here that he may not have like mentioned specifically, and that's that content like that ranks really well on Google. So for SEO, even though he's giving away the names of five of his competitors, by being so generous with the information, Google will recognize that and will send more people that way. So he's kind of taking a risk, but I bet if like we Googled that article, it would probably or something like it, it would totally pop up. No, that, and I have to tell you, that makes perfect sense. What he's saying is, yes, you will lose some business to your competitors, but you will more than make up for it because everybody or most people are going to end up looking at your site. So at least you're in the game. Maybe right now you bid out jobs and you end up getting a third of them. Okay, you'll still only get a third of them, except it'll be a third of a bigger number because more people are coming to your website. Okay, that makes perfect sense. I also think the pricing thing makes sense for you, Jay. I know, there is an intimidation factor, I know, for people walking into a framing store concerned about what it's going to cost. And if you gave a little more information. Like what? Give me an example. A I'm range. Like tw- a range. I, I, could, I just told you the range is it could be anywhere between $150 and $3,000. <laughs> is that helping anybody? No. <laughs> no. Well, I think you could do better than that. Maybe I put pictures of people up. Like here's Lauren Feldman. He came in. And here's what he was wearing. And here's the kind of car he was driving. And here's where he went to school. And he spent $493. And then there's Liz who came in driving a Range Rover and went to Northwestern. And she spent $914. Is that helpful? I mean, I just don't see how to do it. I don't think you're. I have a way. I have a suggestion. Okay, excellent. So if you could photograph some of the work that you do, the framing that you do, and without mentioning any customers, but certainly getting their permission, showcasing those um, in, let's say, your website or your Instagram, and on that, you could somehow put in what the price is. There's the problem, though. Even in a trash container, you could show a beautiful trash container sitting on a street in New York, and I'll get it. Like, oh, that's nice, and oh, it's made well. Forget the $3,000 frame job. The, the $800 frame job probably doesn't look a whole lot different than the $300 frame job on a computer screen. But if you saw it in person, it's like buying a men's suit. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's nothing like putting on an $800 beautiful wool suit that's tailored well. And you think, wow, this is an $800 suit. And then when you go put the $200 suit on, you can tell the difference, I think. At least I can I don't believe I'm going to be able to translate that onto a computer screen where literally the frame ends up being an eighth of an inch thick. I mean, it's it's uh, and the people that are online doing framing. I've heard this from numerous people. They all learned. Keep it simple. The people that are doing online framing are really selling basic. They call it custom framing. For those of us in the industry, it's not really custom framing. It's bare bones. Oh, here's 40 selection. Most frame shops have a thousand corner samples because that's what it takes to really find the perfect frame that when you put it on the piece and the customer picks it up, they gasp because it's so beautiful. And like, oh my, that's what custom picture framing is. I always say to people, they always say, oh, framing's so expensive. And my new answer is, okay, uh, framing's not cheap. I'm not going to argue that. Framing's expensive. The question is, why do so many people do it? And they do it because the the framing you get is magnificent and you look at it every day on your wall and you feel great about it. I can't translate that to a picture on a computer screen. I just wonder if you might pull some people who are a little bit intimidated into a store if they just have some sense of what the, the range is going to be. There's certainly something to that. I could say, for instance, in a beautifully hand-finished blah, and, and give an idea, The real life business issue is when they see it and they're in the store and they really understand how beautiful it's going to look, they might close their eyes and go, okay, and they'll spend the whatever. I might just have the person online say, oh, that's too much money. And that's the risk. And that's the challenge. Um, I don't know that it's going to help any. I could see it. 
I could see it hurting as much as I could see it helping. And then there's different kinds of customers. I have customers that when you show them the beautiful framing and they get it, they hand over the card and they don't blink. And I get people to take a little gasp and they go, wow, that's more than I thought. And then they, they do it. And then there's the people that are struggling with it. I think the difference between me and many friends, I don't know if a lot of people walk out um, uh, at all. All right. Uh, next topic. Uh, last week on the podcast, I announced that I've sold 21 hats and that uh, we're figuring out what exactly that's going to mean going forward. Um, I'm going to continue to run it, but there will be some changes. Uh, happily, I'll have some more resources and be able to do some things I haven't been able to do. But one of the questions that we, we mentioned is, will we keep the name? The uh, entrepreneur who has bought 21 hats um, his theory is kind of, let's not assume that the things that I've been doing on a shoestring are necessarily the best path forward and we should rethink everything. Uh, so we talked about that a little last week and I just want to read one comment we got from a, a listener, Harry Elston, who wrote me, I just finished Tuesday's podcast and I'd like to chime in on 21 hats as a name brand. When I came across the podcast in a general search for something businessy to listen to during commutes and dog walks, I came across the name 21 Hats and I immediately knew that the podcast was designed for small businesses without even looking at the podcast description. The name sang and was immediately recognizable as a small business resource. Of course, you can't tell the quality of the podcast until you hear it. So after about a half episode, I subscribed and then went and binge listened to everything from the beginning. So if your new corporate overlord wants to change the name, I would consider that kind of a jerk move on his part. But that's just me. <laughs> Any thoughts, guys? I want to send him a big box of cookies. I couldn't agree more. I, what can I tell you? I've said that, I think. And I'm thrilled to hear that it resonates like I thought it would resonate. Though, what do I know? I could be wrong. And he's just one person. But I, I'm glad at least one person got it. We know that now. So that's good. Well, I've got a couple thoughts on this. And I mean, the first is that if you are going to rebrand, now would be the time to do it. Definitely. And then the second thing is as much as I do like 21 hats, and I feel like if in your various platforms, um, the podcast, the morning report, the site, anything eventually you have, there has to be something that maybe like a tagline or something that explains what it is. Because I know when I refer to people, other entrepreneurs, I guess I don't feel like they grasp onto it in a way that if the podcast name was a little more intuitive. But then, like Harry said, as an entrepreneur, you do know if someone says 21 hats, you kind of know what that's about. And that's a really unique thing to entrepreneurs. We do have a tagline. I don't think I've done enough to emphasize it. It's 21 hats, what it takes to run a business. Oh, yeah. Which obviously connects the dots uh, as you're describing, but I, I, I haven't. Um, made a, enough out of that, I don't think. If someone can do better, hey, more power to them, all ears. What are you going to call it? I'm kind of like that too. I would say let's, you should consider it, but see what people put on the table. The arguably better option is a name that refers to the mothership. I have been bought by an entrepreneur who is building, his main business is a business that serves other small businesses. And 21 Hats has, you know, no relationship to, to the name of the rebranded business that they will eventually have. So uh, a new name might reflect that other business. OK, there's an argument to you may be consistent and have it match. OK, I, you know, I'd have to see what that name is. But besides which, uh, it's a question of doing some analysis, which I don't know. How are you getting new business? Is 21 hats better bait to get new business? Or he has so many subscribers or customers that the first thing is to make sure that they get it. And I can't argue with that if he says, no, we need it to match because I've got millions of people and I got to make sure they understand this is a, okay. I can't argue with that. My thanks to Jay Goltz and Liz Piccarazzi. As always, thanks for sharing, guys. Really enjoyed it. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, 
Help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Duberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.